Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spyberry podcast is for you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Spybury podcast. I'm Adam Brooks, and our guest today is Jonna Mendez. Her book is In True Face, A Woman's Life in the CIA Unmasked, and the significance of that title will become clear. Now, Jonna came into the public eye, perhaps not least because she's the wife of the late Tony Mendez, who was so memorably portrayed in the movie Argo when he went to Tehran covertly to exfiltrate a group of U.S. diplomats during the Iranian hostage crisis. But... Jonna Mendez had her own long, storied and fascinating career at CIA that she details in her memoir. And that is what we're talking about today. Jonna, welcome to Spybury and thanks so much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. I think I think this is going to be an interesting uh, hour with you. Now, you started in CIA as a secretary, but you argued hard for an operational role, and you got one. I mean, you really got one. Uh, what What was your first operational role at CIA? The first thing I remember doing that was that was getting out on the street, out of the offices, away from the away from the way away from the typewriter, uh, out of the dark rooms. I was working in the dark rooms. Uh, in You're in photography to start with. I I went from secretarial to to photography but very low level baseline photography because I, I had no proper university training and, you know, a lot of the, the, the parameters of the, of the discipline. Anyway, I'm in the dark room and there were about six of us and everyone was gone but me. So I was doing my work and my boss came in and said, we have this, this sudden thing has come up and um, so we have to train someone in secret writing. And this was part of the photo uh, portfolio. And he said, um, secret writing, you mean, you know, writing the, the, the invisible ink, essentially, yeah? Yeah, very, very invisible ink. It was a really secure, if slow method, communicating. So he said, you know, I, I can you do, do you know how to do this? Can you do this? And I said, of course, I can do this. I mean, yes, sure. And he said, what we're going to do is um, you'll meet with this businessman here in town. And He's not the one we want to train. It's his relative. It's in another country, and we cannot go to that country. So we want you to train him to train his relative. Can you do that? I said, yeah. Off we went. I met with this man. He was lovely. He was happy to, uh, to, to go through the process, and it's quite a, quite a detailed process. And at the end, he was, he was good. I introduced myself as Jane from Washington. That was my working name the first time. Um, what a disguise. That's really, that, that doesn't feel terribly creative, I've got to tell you. <laughs> I know, I know. But it comes back. So, so he, went, he went away. And um, we assumed he went and trained his brother. And about three weeks later, here comes this piece of mail to the proper, what we called an accommodation address, which was a fake address. And the letter's there, and I know that it's from his brother up from, from the way it was formatted. So I went in and I developed the message, and it was perfect. It was it was better than most anybody we had trained. But you have to write in block letters. You have to do it just like this, not like that. It's a very precise thing. It's a very secure way to communicate. Um, so it was perfect, and we had this operation then going. We're receiving intelligence from a country that we could not go to, from a man we had never met. It was kind of cute. So the holidays oh, came, it was Christmas. It was Christmas in Europe, and my operational mail came in, and there's another letter from our from our relative in that country. So I opened it up. It's just a blank sheet of paper. But I knew this, the, the system that he had, and they're all very unique, and d developing them is, is a really sensitive thing. So I developed this piece of paper, and it was a Christmas card to Jane from Washington. He had sent you a Christmas card covertly using secret writing. He was kind of breaking. We didn't we never said don't <laughs> don't send Christmas cards, but he was really pushing the envelope. And all the guys in the office laughed because because it was just hysterical. And also no one had ever sent them a Christmas card. And that was 
I'm that very struck fun. throughout the memoir, you sprinkle the whole memoir with these 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 anecdotes, these stories that are very, very arresting, very attention grabbing. It, it, you, arrested, you, it arrested me. It was like I had a secret boyfriend. You went on to become a very accomplished uh, and very operational expert in photography. And you talk a lot in the memoir about going out into the field on operations because you were the person who took the film that had been shot in the Minox camera or whatever camera they were using uh, and developed it on site in a safe house in some foreign city. I mean, talk about that for a little bit. What, what was that like? There was this, there's a scene in the book where I was... Um... <laughs> I tiptoe through this because there are some places that the CIA doesn't want me to name. But I think I said I was in London. So we'll just go on that premise. So I was in London to train um, a foreign asset from the Far East, one of our first major recruitments out there. We had issued him a small uh, fountain pen with a camera in it. it. It was called a tropel. It was one of our most sensitive pieces of equipment. We didn't give that to just anybody. You had to be a pretty important asset for us to issue that pen. That pen. I didn't train him, but now I'm going to meet him because he's coming out of his country. He's going to be in London, and he hasn't done anything with that camera. Uh, we didn't know why. We thought maybe the camera was broken. So I met with him in a hotel. He handed me his camera. He said, I haven't used it because where I'm working is so dimly lit that I don't believe I can get any good images with this little tiny camera. So I don't want to, I don't want to risk, risk, I don't want to risk my life to take a picture that isn't going to be useful to you anyway. So, um, so we're in a very fancy hotel and um, I, we set up a test. We completely darkened the room. We pulled the curtains, we turned off the lights. We, the drapes were over it. We made it as dark as we could make it. And we had a target that I made. And we just started taking pictures and we labeled each one. And then we'd turn on a lamp by the bed and then we'd take a picture. And then we'd, we'd open the curtains, but the blinds are still closed, take a picture. Then we'd open the blinds and take it. So we had a whole series of tests. Then I had to develop it in that hotel room, a very fancy hotel room. So I go in the bathroom because I brought an infrared light source that I need. You, you, you have to do this in total darkness, wearing infrared goggles, using glass tubes, because the, the film in that little tiny camera in a pen is only like... Uh, it's minute, like, right? It's a matter of millimetres wide. If you drop it in the dark, yeah. you can't find it. It's just, it's like, it's like air. So I had to clamp my light source on to something, and there was nothing in that bathroom. It was so cool. It was all marble. It was all curves. There was nowhere for my clamp to go. So I went back out into this suite... And I had to get this long black ebony uh, coffee table and drag it into the bathroom and stand it on its end because I could use the legs to clamp my light. And then I developed the film and then I took it out to him. But it's so tiny, you can't, you can't see it. So I had brought some stuff, a viewing device, and we sat there and we went through that piece of film. And in every instance, except for the very first frame when all the lights were out, it all came out. It was all fine. So you were able to demonstrate to him that the camera, that tiny camera, was sensitive enough to, to work. Yeah. yeah. And then he went back and, and he sent us all kinds of intelligence. You write about sitting in the middle of the night in safe houses in South Asia, um, sweating with no air conditioning, uh, developing these this, these films under sort of enormous time pressure. I mean, how, how, I mean, how do you find yourself uh, responding to the sort of stress of those situations? What was that like? You know, I discovered um, early on that when I, when I take a test, almost any kind of test, I do really well. I do extremely well. I test maybe better than I perform. So a lot of these events that we're talking about, I treated them like tests. You know, it was like a challenge. Do you I think remember, that's a feature of intelligence officers? Do you think they're test takers, like really effective test takers? I don't know. 
I don't know that that is part of, of the, the, the psychological makeup. I know Valerie Plame in one of her books was talking about Meyer Briggs and said that she discovered that so many of her colleagues in the various courses, various places around the world, they come out, they, they, they have the same numeric value in, in Meyer Briggs. I never took Meyer Briggs. So I don't know if I'm one of those people, but, but um, the, the, the personality type that she described is my personality type. Loves a challenge, someone who, who almost puts work ahead of, of other things, almost to a fault where you're obsessed with it. I have found in 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 interviewing um, people in the intelligence world and also in the military. I, I mean, I I feel like I've I, I've sort of identified a trait that seems to be quite common, which is that um, people in these roles tend not to feel pressure or have a very strong kind of autonomic nervous response in these situations. I mean, a lot of us get sweaty palms, our stomach starts turning over, our heart rate goes up, um, uh, and we start feeling shaky. Um, do you not get that? No, I think I get, I get some of that. The thing that usually happened, most of the things that I did were things that I had trained to do. There was a process, there was a way to do all of those 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 film related events, for instance, and so when 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 the film would come into me when I was in the dark room at the beginning of my career, I was in awe of the people that took the pictures because they were taking, they were taking huge risks, they were possibly going to be arrested, and if they were in Russia, they could be killed, I mean they could lose their life, so I would get their film in. And and um. I would lock the doors to the dark room so no one could just wander in and say, by the way, what about, and I just would focus on developing that film. It became really important to me. It's easy. It's easy to make a mistake in a dark room. First of all, it's dark. It's all the right. And And you open the wrong thing or you do it in the wrong order or you pop a lid off of something and, and it's gone. You put it on a reel and, and you get these purple hearts and you can't read it. Any, there's so and then the whole operation is for naught, right? Yeah. So you yeah. just, um, yeah. I think a lot of it was focusing. I think that's why I tested so well, because I was just able to. That's, you know, uh, I, I find that so interesting. Um, you then move on from photography uh, and secret writing. You move into a whole different set of disciplines in CIA, always on the sort of uh, uh, science and technology and services side. But you move into disguise. Uh, and this part of the book is just absolutely fascinating. And and I, I'm I mean I've read stuff in the book that I've never seen anywhere else in any other in any other memoir. I think quite a lot of people have have, have uh, responded to it that way. Um, tell us a bit about disguise. And we're talking about the late Cold War. Um, tell us about disguise and its significance. Um, the fact that I went into disguise was was. Uh could have been a career ending kind of move. I, I spent a summer in a country that I came to love. It was in the subcontinent. Came back and told my career management officer that I would like an assignment there. My career management officer, by the way, was Tony Mendez. He was right. serving as career uh, management. Um, and, and, and to make a move like that, to say, well, to kind of abandon the thing that you really are known for and rather good at, and just to wander over here and say, now I'd like to do that. I was lucky that that didn't put the kibosh on my career. But I plunged into a huge training program just for me. Um, took about a year and a half to really kind of get get my arms around it. And then went on out to that assignment. And we're talking about wigs and moustaches, obviously, but we're talking about eyeglasses. We're talking about skin tone. We're talking about facial hair. We're talking about, I mean, give us a sense of what we're talking about here. You're talking prostheses. You're talking about dental, um, d taking dental impressions of people. When I go to the dentist today, I watch when they're, you know, when they're mixing stuff up saying, I didn't do it like that. I did it like this. <laughs> um, so you'll give people false teeth to change their appearance. Yeah. We, we basically, when, when we sent people overseas, we had a file in the office that had every piece of information we needed to replicate that person back at headquarters, to make clothes for that person, 
to make hair goods for that person. We had we had molds, we had models, we had skin tones, uh, we had special palettes. Of, uh, we knew how to do contact lenses. We knew what their what their pupil distance was if we needed to do bifocals. We could recreate them. And sometimes these are these are your the CIA officers. You took all that data so that specifically you could build disguises for them. Is that what you mean? Not for every officer, but for Moscow bound, for instance, Moscow was worst case. So I always use Moscow as an example of of how how we stretched ourselves in in terms of um, disguise and training. And how were these disguises used on the street in somewhere like Moscow? Well. Um, we did some masks and, and until a couple of years ago, the CIA, well, I never talked about masks. I just assumed they were off, off of the, uh, off the menu of, of things I could discuss. And then I found out that's no, that's not true. The director of my old office was giving a talk and he was talking about masks. Can I just say it's extraordinary the amount of detail that you go into about the masks. These are full face masks that completely change somebody's appearance and some of them have listening devices and radios built in is that right there's um there are a couple of them at the international spy museum behind glass one of them is mine oh really i haven't seen those you can see them so so the thing is that they have been declassified and the only reason that they'd be declassified is because they don't use those masks anymore right so there's there's no harm in talking about them it's fun to talk about them because they were they were incredibly good. Um, so just walk so, us through this. An officer is in is in the embassy in Moscow, and they are going to go out uh, uh, on an operation somewhere in the streets of Moscow. They literally, what do they do? They sit down and they pull this mask on. You can put these masks on in a in a in a car in a dark parking lot without a mirror. They just they they just fit you. Nobody else is going to have that registration when the mask goes on. But when you, you just kind of adjust it, and, and when the eyes are, when it feels good, you know that you can step out of that car and walk out into daylight, and it's going to look fine. Everything is attached to it. If there's a beard, if there's a mustache, if there's hair, of course there's hair. Um, it's all, you don't have to put on a wig. You put on one thing, you put on the mask. Everything else just falls into place. And this is to fool the surveillance teams. You can do you can do a lot with a mask. You can you can fool a lot of people. Uh, we we took the idea from Hollywood, from Hollywood makeup, and then we took the idea further, working with the magic builders out in L.A. In terms of how do you build a deception? How do you build an illusion? How does David Copperfield fly around that arena? <laughs> you know, well, of course he is on wires. You know he's on wires, but. They do everything to convince you that he is not on wires. There's no, there's no swing. There's no, and so you start believing believing that he's that he's flying. That kind of idea of of how you mess with people's minds. No one anywhere is thinking, oh, that guy walking down the street, is he wearing a mask? Right. Not when they saw our mask, it, <laughs> it would never it would never arise. You know, if you see David Copperfield walking through the Great Wall of China and you go, how does he do that? How does that work? It, make it, it, it works some way, right? Because it happens. So there must be a, an answer to that question. Yeah. And what if there are two David Copperfields? What if he uh, has a twin? Right. Maybe right. it's not a real twin. Maybe it looks like a twin. So you might, so you might <laughs> mask up two officers to look the same and have them in different places at the same time. Well, that would be an idea. <laughs> right. how, would you ever, how would you ever know which one was which? Uh, right. fact, you wouldn't. Because you'd never know that there were two. So you could um, do it again and again and again. One of, the, one of the anecdotes that you give us with regard to masks is a great story uh, involving the cleaning ladies at the embassy, the babushkas, the Russian cleaning ladies who would come into the embassy uh, and would leave at the end of the day. Just tell us quickly what, how that worked. That was, uh, we were trying to get someone out on the street um, That's an officer who, from the who, embassy. You're trying to get somebody out from the embassy, operational the embassy, onto the street. Who would not have a surveillance team stepping forward to follow them. And we were just trying to find where, how, how could we do that? Because anybody, any American walking out of that embassy would have a team, at least one team. 
Um, so we looked at the cleaning ladies, the babushkas, and they would come in every day. They kind of came in as a group. They presented. They had their own ID to present to the Marine guards. You know, I am this one, this one, this one. So when they came in, they were all checked. But when they left, no one was checking when they left. And if there was a new one, nobody was checking. They, they, they were never the same anyway. They, they were just constantly in flux, these cleaning ladies that came in and did our embassy. So we took uh, one of our one of our people. Oh, and, and we were interested in getting a woman out on the street because the, the KGB never used women. And, and we were pretty convinced that they would never believe that we would use women. So we had... Um, we had a couple of women that were used on the streets successfully, but our our person, we we had to we had to be careful with her clothes, with her shoes, with everything that she had on her, because there was something called spy dust that the Russians were using to mark Americans, and if 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 her shoes had spy dust on them, on her or, or her clothing or her bag or anything, they could pick up on that when she passed certain choke points. So everything had to be mailed in. Nothing had ever touched Russian soil. And she got out successfully, came back later. Came back later in her American clothes, which were under her babushka clothes, carrying one of those Berioska bags from the dollar stores that that foreigners could go to. So you disguised, you disguised her as one of these babushkas and she left the embassy as a babushka. And came back in. And then as came a, back in as an American. With the, and the babushka stuff was in the very <laughs> just, just extraordinary. I was going to ask you about the spy dust too. I've I've read one reads about the spy dust, but what was what was this? this was real? I mean, what was this? We wrote a whole book called Spy Dust. You did. It was one of, Tony and I wrote it together. It was one of our one of our earliest books. It was a chemical. It was in PPD, and right now I'd have to look up what that stands for. But it was a chemical that uh, if you touched it. Uh, it, 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 it had a luminescence to it. it, it you couldn't see it with your naked eye, but they had all kinds of ways to check and see. They were checking not just if Americans had spy dust on them, but if the Russians that they were going by, meeting with, if they had spy dust. They were putting I see. It so on. it was basically a marker for anybody who had been in contact with the U.S. Embassy. It was. Yeah. It was. And it was invisible, so it was really, really hard to know what we were dealing with. We just knew it was there. It was on our, they'd put it on the handles of the American cars parked in the, you know, the parking lot right. at the embassy. They, so if any Russian had touched an American or been given a document or anything, they would trigger the devices. And that meant, as you just mentioned a moment ago, I was very taken by this detail, that it meant that whenever you, you wanted to put somebody on the street, all their clothes, they had to be Russian clothes that had never been worn in Russia, can you and they had to come in from the outside yep. so that they wouldn't have this spy dust on them. Yep. Just the logistics of that are just mind boggling. Well, the logistics were really, really hard. But then then we were working with some some Russian assets. We were protecting them. Um, the intelligence that we got from some of them was worth more than more than what we were doing. I mean, the, the the price that we paid for working in Moscow was money well spent. These, particularly the masks, I mean, the complexity and resources and effort that went into creating this whole sort of universe of disguise. Was CIA the only agency doing this or did other agencies do it too? That's did other a, countries, other intelligence services do it? People don't really understand how all of that works. There is no country in the world where American intelligence officers, embassy people, undergo the kind of scrutiny that we had in Moscow. It was a smothering embrace of us. And the, the whole goal was just to shut us down so we couldn't meet with Russians who would want to provide information so that we could not collect intelligence. When the Russian intelligence people come to the United States and they're stationed in Washington, D.C., and they are in their embassy and a few other places. They don't have anything like that that they have to confront. We don't, we don't put this blanket of surveillance over them. We don't do it that way. There's no country in the world that does it like that except for this 
Moscow was just like a paranoid city. So you're saying it was a function of necessity, really, that other other intelligence services no, wouldn't need it. Is that right? No one else really needs this kind of. Uh, huh. One time you simulated uh, a facial wound. You you built a mask uh, which had kind of wounds and blood all over it for an exfiltration. Can you can you just tell us that story? I still think that was brilliant. <laughs> We were in a we were in a country that um, there was some hopeful thinking that there was a, a, a diplomat from a foreign country was going to defect and come to our American embassy and ask for refuge and ask for some help. So anticipating that, we, we were trying to figure out how would we receive someone like that? And then how would we get them out of the country? Because if that happened... And this has happened in other countries where someone comes into the American embassy looking for protection and then the locals would just set up around the embassy waiting for that person to emerge someday. So um, there, there are a lot of ways around that. But what we did in this one instance was uh, the person the person that we thought might be coming to, to visit us was not too big. He was smallish. And we had um, some guards in our embassy. Uh, one of them was about the same size. And so our idea at the time, which we never used, to my knowledge, the idea was if that person came rushing into our embassy and said, I want to defect, what we were going to do was put him in the, the uniform of the guard. And then we were going, We had a story all, all waiting that the guard had been handling a piece of, uh, uh, actually it was a grenade, that he had been fiddling with it and playing with it and, and that it had gone off in his hand and had really that's and had damaged his face so we made the damage that was the disguise you made a mask with the damage on it with faked up blood and wounds on it it was just a horrible wound and the plan was we we call in um, um some american medevac we put him on one of those stretchers for back wounds and he would be carted off and, and we just loved the idea and we were always waiting looking did they use it? Did it work? You know, they never used it. That I well, they never used it in the end. <laughs> right. But that exfiltration thing, uh, Tony became well known because of, of his Argo exfiltration, but it was always an issue. How are you going to move people across borders? We were right, always right. And you talk a lot about that in the in Trying the, in to get the ahead too. of it. Yeah. So, so what do we yeah. do then if, if, if this happens? If, yeah. We, um, were, we were problem solvers in my office. We were trying to anticipate problems and come up with novel solutions uh, just across the board. It was a very creative workplace. One very specific thing I wanted to ask, there's a term that you use in one of your um, stories. You refer to people from a particular section of CIA, a particular office of CIA, as being from third story. I've never heard that term before, and I don't see it anywhere else in the literature. Can you tell me what third story means? What does that term mean? Uh, to me, third story meant some sort of um, a crook who would maybe scale the outside of a building, go in, steal something, and leave. Third story guy. Was that a term that was in use in, in, in the agency? I can't remember where I heard it first, but there was a group of people, and that was, that was their expertise. So it's so, so third story refers to building stories, does it? Yeah. Right, we, right, we right. So this it. is like a, a covert a, a covert group that, that, that specialized in... Covert in entry. Covert entry. I see, I see. I've never heard that term before. I was fascinated. We, Your we, book we, is full we, of these little nuggets that we, I'm surprised, we, frankly, you got past the censor. We even hired a man uh, at one point. He was very skilled. I mean, we would have hired him no matter what. But he was so small that that was in his favor. He was a very little man. And we, we looked at him and said, oh, yes, he can get in places that nobody would dream a person could get in. He became a yeah. burglar, did he? He did, yeah. That was, he, he, was, he was famous for that in my office. Good heavens. Um, now, you talk a lot about 
uh, obviously, you know, you talk a lot about being a woman in CIA at a time when there were very few women rising to operational positions. Uh, and in a very, very interesting passage, you describe an incident on a training course that you went through. You took a training course in resisting interrogation. Mm. And this incident was related to your own personal claustrophobia, your fear of enclosed spaces. And this was a moment that seems to have really changed you. It meant something uh, uh, very profound to you. Can you just tell us about that incident? Um, I, I always was claustrophobic. And I, I, at the beginning of the book, I take it back to when I was a kid and I got locked in a, in a space in my mom's kitchen uh, under the sink, that cabinet, and um, I couldn't get out. And, and I don't know if that's what started it, but it was always somewhere in my head. This course the CIA, the CIA gave was for tra traveling technical officers, people who are on planes a lot. And back then, they were hijacking planes. Uh, they, were, they were shooting Americans occasionally if you were found on a, a plane that they had hijacked. There was some danger in, in traveling. And good old CIA... They had a training course for that. They trained you about everything. I was in training so often. This course was called hostile interrogation. So what if you somehow become captive somewhere in the world, all kinds of ways that could happen, whether you're on a plane or in a place, but you could end up uh, in a bad place. So how do you get through that? How do you manage that? Most of us have never, ever had anything like being held in a cage. Think, I kept thinking of John McCain when I was taking that course. He was like Exhibit A. Mm -hmm. they, had, they brought in some prisoners of war and talked to us about what do you do with long-term incarceration? How do you actually, how do you manage that? Think of a year or two years. How and what manage? did they do to you specifically? They were particularly kind of vicious, these guys. What did they do to you? We were on a bus going to lunch and there was smoke and a bomb and uh, people came on the the bus and put bags over our heads, black bags, and dragged us off. And they took us into this prison in the woods and they put us in cells. And while just being, just having that thing over my head, a black, and it was tight. And I, it's a training course. I knew the whole time I'm in a training course. I'm not going to die here, but, but I can't breathe. And I said to the man who had me, I said, you know, I'm having a little problem in here. He didn't care. I had just gotten my ears pierced. They made me take them out. That was that was a whole long story. But I ended up in a in a cell. Um, I was there for a couple of days, two and a half days. In that, you couldn't you couldn't you had to stand barefoot on concrete. Right, you couldn't lie down. You, there was no place to lie. It was a little narrow cell. You there, if if you tried sitting down, you'd have your knees on your chest and you'd be. Uh, but then they'd come by and scream and yell. I sat down once. I never sat down again. Um, they fed us two one half cups of rice and two one half cups of water in almost three days. And they did this knowing that you were claustrophobic. They did it deliberately. Right? Oh yeah, they're, they're going to train you. It doesn't matter. Other people probably had other other issues they had to deal with. So the first thing that happened is you start getting really hungry. You start getting really uncomfortable. You start getting cold. They're playing some kind of terrible music and static in the background, and the lights were always on. And it was just like, they actually removed a couple of people from that course. Um, I'm they, sure they did. I'm sure most of us would last well, 20 minutes. Well, you know, <laughs> you start thinking, okay, I get it. I understand. I get, I get this now. So I'd like it to stop now. And of course, it, it, it wasn't going to stop. But, and then when but I thought, you got through this. You got through it. You got through several days of being of being yeah. stuck in this coffin-like cell. And something kind of changed in your head when you came out of that. What what was it? This is that testing thing, though. I got through it because because I test really well. Remember, we were talking. Mm. When I came out of it, um, I don't know. I, I was I was almost euphoric. My, my the director of my training who put some of us in that course. He went to a hospital with nerve damage in his uh, foot I'm standing on concrete. What I did, <laughs> I went shopping. <laughs> I, had, I had to teach a course the next day. I taught about 100 case officers about the use of disguise. We knew that I had no idea that I was going to go through hell 
a day before I had to teach the course. But you use that word euphoric. You got through it and, it and it suddenly made you sort of understand something about yourself. But that I could, I could, I could do that. I could do that. I could probably do more. I discovered that I could leave mentally, leave this box they had me in. That was a separate thing from the cell. It was so awful. And I could go to this landscape and be there instead of in the box. And it was like wearing my infrared goggles when I developed that film in the dark rooms. So everything was green, looking through a green lens. And I was back in Kansas. And I could be there and stay there. I, who spent my, 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 my youth trying to get out of Kansas, that was a goal when I lived there. Once I'm pushed up against a wall, that's where I found my comfort, was going back to Kansas. I was in that tall grass prairie, and it was all green. <laughs> so I went and bought a new dress with flowers <laughs> on it. Big I can't I you went never shopping. Had a dress like Retail that. therapy after a three-day hostile interrogation course. Yes. Um, it, it, it seems to, yeah, I mean, it seems to say something about this ability of people to um, control their responses, not allow the the adrenaline and the stress and the pressure to overwhelm your self-control. It's, it's, it, it, it's a quality that, that um, seems to me to be quite hard to define. I, I'm, I, and you sort of almost seem to be struggling to define it yourself. You know, in the in the world that we live in, none of us ever know. You just don't, you know, if you, in a really severe situation, how would you react? I mean, we see on TV, we see people, look at those people today in Gaza. They're starving. None of us have ever been starving. I mean, what, hung, what does hunger do to you after a couple of days? How do you react to that? How do you deal with that? That was part of being in the boxes and being in that cell. I, I learned about myself, not just it was three days altogether, but I have a good sense of how how I how I reflexively responded and then how I should respond. I learned so much about myself in three days. And you can take that with you when you're done with that course. And you, you've just got it inside of you and you're like, I'll be okay. Mm. Because I, I can manage pretty much anything that's coming. So later in the book, I'm walking in an alley and there's a whole bunch of guys in that alley in a foreign country and they're all half drunk and they're all armed. It's part of a drug cartel. And my training said, I come around a corner and they're there. They all turned and looked at me. And my training said, you cannot turn and go back. You gotta walk through these guys. I mean, it was, it was no decision made. I just kept walking. They stepped aside. I walked through them. I honestly thought they might shoot me because they didn't, they wouldn't have suspected I was CIA, but they might have thought I was DEA, drug enforcement. Mm. I had no business being where they were and they, they, they would shoot you in a heartbeat. But they didn't shoot me. Let me ask you something else. You talk about a bit in the book, but you don't really develop a whole lot. Um, and I'm fascinated by it. Uh, how do you keep the details of your professional life as a, as a CIA officer from the people that know you? You, you? you write a little bit about how you drifted out of contact with people, how you had to dissemble in your, in your daily life with people that you had known your entire life. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about that. What does it feel like to do that? And, and do you think it took a toll on you? I think it took a toll. I think it takes a toll on all of us. This is just my experience. I can't speak for, you know, everyone I knew. But when I went into the CIA, I had the sense that I was walking through a door, going into a place that a lot of the people I knew could never, could never imagine. I talk about insiders and outsiders. When I joined CIA and then we started traveling from this assignment to this assignment to this assignment. The only constant was the insiders, the people inside of CIA, they become your friends. And in effect, they become your family. And the outsiders drop away because it's such an effort 
it is such an effort to keep up that that cover thing. That sounds so lonely. Well, as long as you've got this new family inside, you can you can do that. That when it gets lonely is at the end of your career. When you have to go back through that door. And now all your friends are inside. And you're going out the door. And there it really severs those relationships. Because you discover that the relationships inside the CIA, they're all built around, we're all working, this. we're all headed the same direction, we're doing similar things, we have similar beliefs. And the conversations, the day-to-day conversations, are all kind of like, have you seen Harry? No, I think he went, you know, it, it's that. Mm. And those conversations stop, and you end up on the other side of the door, and you have to go back and try and put your outside life back together that's fine you you transitioned back into into what you might call civilian life when you left the agency you, you'd married tony uh you had a child and then suddenly there was the whole hollywood thing there was argo and there was so your story i think is very particular isn't it if not unique other people from cia when they transition back into the world how does it go i can't imagine it goes as well for everybody as it went for you I don't know how it really goes for them. We lived we lived on 40 acres down a one mile dirt road. Our neighbors, when we retired, were so far away. And everybody around us had 40 acres or more. And they were out there because, because they liked it that way. They, 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 they were never close friends, those mm. neighbors. But I must say, when they found out that Tony was a spy, they were shocked. They were mm. stunned. I, I that didn't. It didn't make that much difference. We found you. You write about a lifelong friend. I think her name is Liz, right? Who yeah. who she only finds out after what thirty years of of friendship with you that you were that you were an intelligence. She, she officer. found out because sixty minutes came to our art show. Tony and I made new careers as artists. He's always been a painter. Mm. I I had done fine art photography. His grown son was a sculptor. We had something called Pleasant Valley Studios. We had huge art shows. That was our new family. 60 Minutes came to one of our art shows because they after Argo and they thought they, they'd like to do that. Uh, we sent a message out to everyone on our mailing list, a couple of thousand people. We said, the media will be here if that's an issue. You know, just know. And then Liz came down from New York to surprise us. And the first person she ran into was, um, I think it was the producer of the piece, who said, well, what was it like having, you know, your good friend? Spy. Was a spy. Liz didn't know that. She didn't know, didn't know that. Liz was, was uh, Did your friendship survive that? It did, but it's never, it's never been what it was. Mm. And, you know, I get that. Yeah. I couldn't tell her. Mm. Can't tell. Let me ask you this. Going back to the, to the actual intelligence work for a second... The period that you describe, the, 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 the techniques, the tradecraft that you talk about, the disguise, the photography, the secret writing, uh, this was, it was mostly kind of the latter part of the Cold War. Uh, the period you describe was mostly pre-digital. Yep. Um, a lot of the tradecraft you talk about is basically analog. I mean, absolutely fascinating. But do you have a sense of how things have changed in that world since you left? Well, they must change. And it's, it's, it's a two-sided coin. It's why I can talk about it. Because what we did of course, yeah. is, is no longer, a lot of it is not considered uh, classified. I know that the, the CIA has always been composed of four directorates. Now there are five. The fifth new directorate is cyber. Has to be. Mm. Um, I know that as new technology emerges, and it was coming there at the end of my career, you could see it. We were the cue of CIA. We were the technical arm of the intelligence community. And as a new technology would come in, a piece of digital, we would start figuring out, well, that's, that's a threat to us. So what can we do with it? Is there a way that we can take that threat and turn it into a useful tool for us? Can we somehow take what looks like the, the biggest problem on the horizon and turn it into an advantage for us? 
That was always the mindset at CIA. Do you think I, one of your masks would beat facial recognition technology today? I don't. I don't know. I would. I would guess not, and I would guess that's why I'm talking about it. Right. I see. I would, yes. I would yeah. guess that mm. it is no longer um, that useful in in some in some environments. It would probably work, but they must have come up with something better or a new way to do it or a new material. Because depending on the camera on the lamppost, you know, what kind of light source it's using, what kind of imagery, it's it's a, our masks looked really good to the naked eye. You couldn't see them. But that thing on the lamppost is not a naked eye. Last question. When you look back over your entire career in intelligence, when you think of yourself in terms of, you know, an agent of the state out there exercising American power in the world, and you think about your own life experiences, and then you think about the world today, and you think about American power today. What what do you think about? What keeps you up at night as a as a as an old intelligence officer? Well, I I worry about the world today. I worry about the level of threats we're looking at, and and the, the amount of various threats in the world. Um, I worry about, you know, what we thought we were doing, what we were meant to be doing was bringing back to the United States um, information about the plans and intentions of our enemies. That was kind of the name of the game. What are they going to do? What's Putin going to do? What's what's China going to do? What's North Korea going to do with those missiles? I have to assume that that goal is still the same. I think it's probably harder to collect that information. Um, and it's becoming harder and harder to separate out the truth from from just the noise. The internet has made it possible for people to get into, into our own computer systems here and fiddle with them. Uh, I, I just think the job must be so much harder than it was when we were there. We were, we were doing humans, mostly human intelligence, we had people working for us, passing information to us. And now I think probably it's mostly in the ether. And, but there still has to be a human connection. It doesn't work unless there are people meeting people, people agreeing, yes, I will. I will give you that information um, for whatever whatever it is that motivates me. Maybe I want my kids in Western schools. Maybe Maybe I want to do harm to my country because of what it did to my family. People, people do espionage for many, many different reasons, but it's always people. It's, it's, it's driven by ego. It's driven by ideology. It's driven by money sometimes. And it'll always be there. Always. John Mendez's book is In True Face, A Woman's Life and the CIA Unmasked. It's an absolutely extraordinary read, and it's been such a privilege to talk to you today, Jonna. Thank you so much for joining us. I love talking to you today. Thank you. 